Good morning. So it's not spring. <laughs> I could not believe it when I looked out this morning. Anyway, we're happy to be here. And uh, a couple of announcements. One next Sunday, which is the first Sunday of April, uh, we're going to serve communion. So we'll hope that all of us can join in that. So it's been a while since we had communion and share together. So look forward to doing that next week. We're sharing it with you. And also on the 24th, just an advance announcement, on the 24th of April, we're going to be have continuation of our discussion that we had yesterday. We had a looking at the sort of where we're going, steps forward, whatever you want to call it. We had a good discussion together, about 25 of us came out. And uh, I think we made some progress. And there, for, there will be coffee time, by the way, after today. And there are sheets in the hall, if you weren't here yesterday, that will highlight what we covered yesterday. And the, all the ideas are all there. So have a look. And we're going to be thinking about that over the next few weeks. And on the 24th, right after church, we're going to meet again over coffee and discuss further. So hopefully you can keep that in mind. Let us worship God now. Thank you for joining us and also those who are joining us on this recorded service. May God be with all of us as we worship together. Amen. We're going to open with a My Lighthouse. I think we all know this. Let's stand together. In the silence you won't 
So this is the fourth Sunday of Lent, and the Presbyterian World Service and, and Development put out these uh, slides that we can use each week, and this week we have this one, and I'd like you to follow along with it. During Lent, we remember that even when we disobey and turn away, we are still loved by God. God does not give up on us. God breaks our stubbornness and calls us back from our wandering so that we can experience the joy and peace that comes from following Christ. May we have the courage to hear, to change, and to align ourselves with Christ. Persistent God, help us to listen for your voice. Let us hear what you are saying to us and make us willing to change our ways. Break our resistance, forgive our sins, and call us back to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our prophet, priest, and king, we pray. Amen. Come thou fount of every blessing. I know we sang this last week, but we talked yesterday about singing of the older hymns. Well, I think this qualifies. This is one of the older hymns. And um, I chose this, asked Rachel to do this one again, because there's a couple of stanzas in this particular hymn that we're going to be quoting in the sermon. So let's stand together and sing it. Let us bring our prayers of confession to God. Let us pray together. God of mercy and mystery, we gather to worship you because we believe that our lives are in your hands. We gather to worship you because we believe that your love for the creation and every person on this planet is both bold and astonishing. And we also gather to worship you because you alone have the words of eternal life, words that give us purpose and meaning. And we also know that without your grace, we have no hope of finding this love that can change our lives 
and our world. We know about your presence that fills the universe, that occupies our life, that makes our life in the world true and good. We notice your powerful transformative presence in word and sacrament, in food and water, in gestures of mercy and practices of justice, to gentle neighbors and daring gratitude. But we also know about your absence. So come again, come soon. Come to every garden that's become a jungle, to every community that's become joyless, sad, and numb. We acknowledge your dreadful absence and long for your presence right here in the midst of us where there is a sense of loss, of uncertainty, and sometimes confusion. Come, Lord Jesus, into our hearts and make us, once again, hearts of flesh. God of love and mercy, as we pause for a moment in your presence, when even now the daily details of our lives press in on us, we recall things left undone, opportunities ignored. We remember careless words spoken, disappointments that will not let us go. We offer, you, we offer to you our confession in the name of Jesus our Lord, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of our sins. Forgiveness of our sins that is according to the riches of your grace that you have lavished on us in him. Lord, hear our prayer as we offer these prayers in the name of Jesus our Lord, who taught us to pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hear the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, by faith, we have God's forgiveness. Thanks be to God. Children's time. Nice to see you again. How are you doing? Going skiing this afternoon? No. <laughs> well, today we're going to be looking at a parable. Do you know what a parable is? Yes. Stories that Jesus told? Is that what you said? Yep. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. He told stories, and a lot of them were parables. And we have a very famous parable today, actually one of the longest parables that Jesus ever gave. Which one do you think it would be? The longest parable, and you only find it in one place. You know, sometimes when you look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you find them repeated in these different Gospels. But in this particular case, this longest parable in the, in the New Testament happens to be only in one of the Gospels. Do you know which one it would be? Starts with L. <laughs> Luke, and you find it in chapter 15, and it's about, well, it's a, there's three parables, actually. There are three shorter, two shorter ones. One is about uh, um, a, ma a shepherd who loses a sheep, and he leaves the 99 sheep back in the fold, and I guess he's got some that looks after them, and he goes out searching for the one that's lost. Have you ever been to Scotland? No? You need to go there sometime. Center of civilization. Um, if you go to Scotland and you drive up through the highlands, you'll see sheep all over the place. And when I was about your age, I went on a two-week holiday up to a farm in, near Pitlochry up in the highlands, and we got to run wild. And I also got to shear one of the sheep. You know how they cut all the wool off? That was an experience. I also got to drink the milk right out of the cow 
That was an experience too. Not, not good for you. <laughs> anyway, sheep are everywhere there and they have dogs that kind of look after them and bring them back to the fold. Well, the shepherd goes out and he finds the sheep and he comes back and what does he do? He has a party and he jo- brings all the neighbors in and they have a big party because they're so thankful that they found the sheep. The other parable is about a woman who loses a, a nickel and she looks all over the house, she turns everything upside down and eventually she finds it. And she's so happy, she has, a, she has a party and all the neighbors come in and have a big party. Well, you're getting the message, right? <laughs> Something that was lost has now been found. And then the last and longest of the parables is about the son who left home and then came back. And this father says, oh, my son who was dead is now alive, who was lost is now found, let's have a party. And I think the message that Jesus is trying to convey is, every time one of us who have wandered away and come back, he says, the angels in heaven have a big party. Now, you didn't know that that was the case, right? But that's true. God is really happy when we come back. So hopefully we won't wander too far because God's going to find us. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for continuing to watch over us, to seek us out, and to help us to find our path back to you each time we wander. Be with each one of the children today and bless them and watch over them. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. So we're going to read that story now, and I believe, um, Bruce, you're going to come and help us, lead us in this, right? Uh, the reading is from Luke 6, 27 to 36. To you who are ready for the truth, I say this, love your na- enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with, a, with supple moves of prayer for that person. If someone slaps you in the face, stand there and take it. If someone grabs your shirt, gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. If someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more payback, live generously. Here is a simple rule of thumb for behavior. (coughs) Ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. If you only love the lovable, do you expect a pat on the back? Run-of-the-mill sinners do that. (coughs) If only, excuse me, if you only help those who help you, do you expect a medal? Garden variety sinners do that. If you only give her what you hope to get out of it, do you think that's charity? The stingiest of pawnbrokers does that. I tell you, love your enemies, help and give without expecting a return. You'll never, I promise, regret it. Live out this God-created identity the way our Father lives towards us, generously and graciously, even when we're at our worst. Our Father is kind. You be kind. Now may the words of my mouth, the meditation of each one of our hearts, be acceptable to you, Lord, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Well, that wasn't what I meant to read this morning. (laughs) That was last week's reading. But anyway, you all knew that, right? What I meant to be read was the story of the prodigal son. 
or some would call it the loving father. So we've said that there's two parables of something that's lost and found, but it's the third parable that really intrigues us, which is the, the one where the son decides that he wants to get away from the estate, to get his share of the estate, and to leave home, get as far away as he can from his home. And of course, the fact that he does this, that he asks for his inheritance or his share, which would be a third because he's the younger son, that's a pretty terrible affront to his father. He's basically saying to his father, you're as good as dead. I'm not interested in this anymore. The older son, of course, stays home. He's reliable, he's loyal, and he's hardworking. We're not gonna be talking about the older son so much today, but it's a, that's for another time. Well, my hunch is that uh, many of us can identify with this younger brother. He's young and restless, possibly feeling trapped within the family estate and kind of bored with the work. He wants to experience life on a bigger scale. And he doesn't want to have all the family responsibilities and restraints on him. And so it took him only a few days to gather up his things and get ready to leave. And he left down the path with a spring in his step. He's going somewhere new, out into the world. And there's something about this rebellious attitude and desire to get away from his family that may suggest a very common metaphor for our wandering away that we talked about today in our hymn. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, don't you? Prone to leave the God I love, here's my heart, take and seal it, seal it for the courts above. <laughs> Like this young man that Jesus talks about in the parable, we too find ourselves seduced by the world. We too, many of us, have found ourselves wrapped up in ourselves, our material advancement, our search for pleasure, at the expense of our roots in the faith. So many have wandered away for all different reasons. The young man in our parable doesn't just slide into this. He makes a very deliberate choice. I'm leaving. I want nothing to do with you. But a couple of years after I became a Christian, I found myself wandering back to the life that I had been in. I stopped going to church. I definitely stopped reading the Bible, and I definitely stopped praying. I became really disconnected from my faith. Didn't happen overnight, but imperceptibly my life drifted slowly but surely away from church and faith. And I ended up back where I had been. Went on, went, on, went on for a couple of years. And uh, to get back seemed impossible. I was so far away. I found myself lost, unsure of myself, unsure of where my life was going. And then something happened. <laughs> Some other crisis that turned the corner for me again. And I found my way back to church, back to God. That's another story. I know it's been a long time since we were young, <laughs> but you may remember those heady days of youth as we lived on the brink of adulthood. Those were days of thunder and lightning, stormy winds, <laughs> all kinds of strange awakenings in our bodies and our thoughts. Our bodies and our social words, our relationships seem to have become charged with energy. All kinds of conflicting feelings, 
Oh yeah, I remember those years. I know it was a long time ago, but I still remember. When I was about 14, we, a bunch of us, 14 year olds, in the neighborhood, we set off on a, a bank holiday train trip. Yeah, we went to Perth, a lovely little town of about 40,000 people right there on the Tay River that flows down towards Dundee and the, and the ocean. And we went there because we went to train spot. Now you probably, Canada, you probably didn't do train spotting, right? We used to have as kids, we had books full of all the numbers of the trains all over England, Scotland, Wales. And the thing was, you, were, you, you couldn't cheat, you had to underline when you saw one that had that number. <clears throat> and the most important trains were the shielders. They had big shields on the side, <coughs> and if they were really important, they had red letters, and they had a name. <coughs> well, when you saw one of those, well, you had payday. So that's what we did. We went to the Perth Rail Yard and we tried to find trains that we never found in our hometown. What freedom, what bliss, what independence. 14 year olds all on our own. I remember we went on rowboats in the middle of this little pond lake. <laughs> yes, those were the days full of wonder. But as we grew older, we learned to play the game, play the game by the rules and settle for less than our soaring imagination said. I still remember standing on the street corner with my friend Tom Buick, probably about 14 years old, 15 years old, maybe 16. Let's go off to the Merchant Navy and see the world. <laughs> We're bored here. But like many of our young dreams, they all died. We settled into jobs, we entered relationships, and found ourselves locked into the same pattern as our dreary parents. <laughs> or at least they seemed dreary to us. Where did all of our dreams go? Where did those awakenings, that passion, that imagination that had gripped us, where did it all go? With all his restraints gone, this young man takes off. And while he has money, and lots of friends take advantage of that, and help him to spend it. And he probably tried everything available in the city that he had gone to. Brother said, or Jesus says, he spent on dissolute living. His older brother says his father that he spent on wine and women, and what well, wine, women, and song, you know. He spent it all. When I was teaching in the Maritimes at university, when all the young students arrived all of, from all the little villages and towns all over the Maritimes, they'd come to the university, and they began to sow their wild oats. And drinking became a huge problem. You know, there was more, they, they were the highest capita drinkers in Canada. That little, tiny little village called Sackville, New Brunswick. Because they had come from all these small villages and remote sheltered backgrounds and then they get to the big world. And overnight they became independent, free from the restraints of their dreary parents and from their religious restraints. And often this freedom had disastrous consequences, as it had for this young man in the story. Far from home, he finds himself flat broke. All this money is gone. And a famine at the same time hits that country and it's even worse for him. He can't go back to his father. I mean, he's, he's 
can't, he just can't. What should he do? Well, he could hire himself out as a laborer and he could work and make enough money to scrape by. So that's what he does. Only he, uh, if that wasn't demeaning enough, the job itself is positively brutal for his self-image. He's told to look after the pigs. Here's a good Jewish young man <laughs> with the pigs. He's become a Gentile. And when he sees the pigs eating the pods, he thinks, I can't even get that. But then he came to himself. He suddenly woke up. He had a thought. He had one of those ah moments. What should I do? Why am I sitting here in all this mud amongst the pigs? I could go home to my father. And so he rehearses his speech. Here's what I'll say to my father. I've made a huge mistake. I'm willing to work as one of your normal workers. I don't have to be your son anymore. I'll just come back and at least I'll have a meal, three meals a day. I don't think this means he was converted. <laughs> I don't think this is repentance. He's simply at the end of his rope. And so he begins to rehearse the speech. When I read Henry Nouwen's personal book, The Return of the Prodigal Son, any of you read this? I learned how influential this parable had become for this great saint of the church, Henry Nouwen. This painting by Rembrandt. Yeah, it's not very easy to see, is it? Apparently, Rembrandt's white life was a mirror image of the young man in the, in the picture. When he was 30, <clears throat> Rembrandt painted himself with his young wife. <clears throat> he is, as interpreted by Nouwen, brash, self-confident, spendthrift, sensual, arrogant. That was the night when he was younger. That was his painting of this scene. He paints himself with his young wife as, a, as the lost son of a brothel, in a brothel. He appears drunk with a half-empty glass of beer raised by his right hand and the other is on the lower back of the woman. His eyes speak to us and say, isn't life fun? That's when he was younger. 30 years later, Rembrandt painted the same scene, only this time, it's totally different. He paced the young man in tattered rags, kneeling at the feet of the father in penitence, and the scene is powerful in its stillness. There's no movement. Light shines on the face of the father and on the bald head of the son. But it is the tenderness of the hands on the shoulder of the son that melts Nowen's heart. Nowen would spend hours up in, uh, it's in Petersburg, where the painting is to be found, and he sat and gazed at it for hours. And it would be this picture that would grip him for the rest of his life. He was made to feel like this lost son, the portrait, who had finally come home. That's how Nouwen felt. The son returns home with a speech prepared. But he doesn't get to offer the speech because the father runs down the lane with arms outstretched, which no one would ever forget in the neighborhood. Such an undignified thing to do for an older man. Villagers would have talked about this embarrassing moment for a long time. But the father in the parable, like God the Father, cannot wait to embrace the son. 
who has been lost and now is found. And the joy celebrated is evident in all these parables. The father says to the servants, get the fatted calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Jesus is saying that's what God feels when you come back. Have you come back? No matter our age this morning, no matter where our wandering has taken us, God waits for our move. There at the Father's feet in helplessness and hope, we discover love. And that's the promise of the gospel to each one of us. Home at last, says the painting. It's not a surprise that at the end of each of these parables, there is a great party. This is the most, this is the, the boldest and most important move that we can make. So that heaven rejoices with the church when each sinner is saved by grace. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Yes, I left a long time ago. But it was only for a short time. I found my way back. God has never let me go again. <laughs> There's a love, love little phrase in Paul's letter, I think it's to Timothy, he says, you know, we might, we might forget God, but God will never let us go. Have you come home yet? Have you been found what was lost? It's all because of grace that has brought me this far. Thanks be to God. Before the throne of God above, let's stand together and sing. Amen. 
with Christ my Savior and my God. Let us bring our prayers to God. Gracious God, you have called us together as your people to be the church of Christ. Unite us here at West Flamborough to be one in faith and discipleship, breaking bread together, telling the good news, so that the world may believe that you are love and turn to your ways and live in the light of your truth. Creator God, you made all things and called them good. We pray for the earth and its vulnerability, depleted by our lifestyle choices and our economic expectations. Inspire reverence for the earth in all people. Guide our leaders and each one of us to make wiser choices for the sake of the planet. Help us to use the planet's resources wisely with future generations in mind, guarding the fragile balances that you have set between many precious species makes our hearts glad to see the birds return from a long winter. <clears throat> we thank you for their cheerful songs and their beautiful colors. They cheer our hearts as they return to our gardens and our neighborhoods. <clears throat> as we witness cities and towns and villages burning in Ukraine, as we hear women and children cry at the loss of their homes and loved ones, and while tanks continue to roll down roads and city streets and missiles destroy buildings, we confess that to proclaim your kingdom coming feels like a bit of a stretch. Yes, we pray your kingdom would come as it is in heaven. But this seems such a bold prayer in the face of the brut brutal reality of our world. We reach out beyond what we witness to you who sits in the heavens, to you who is Lord and God, and we pray for peace. <clears throat> Be present with the victims of this terrible war in ways that neither we nor them can imagine. Save us and save them as only you can do. In your love and power and your compassion and justice, save them because this is your world and these are your children that you created. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <clears throat> Today we reflected on a loving father welcoming his youngest son home. We truly, deeply thank you for welcoming us home. Sometimes we have to confess that we respond just like the older brother and close our hearts to your mercy. But thank you for your patience with each one of us who like the brother, older brother at times can close our hearts to you and our neighbor. We bring to you today the prayers from, of our congregation Thank you for the good news about Noah's treatments, that he has come through another one. We thank you for his strength, for the strength and love and faith of his parents. We continue to pray for Margaret, that her healing will continue. We continue to pray for Florine, we remember to you, Tyler. And in the silence, we bring to you the names of individuals that we love and care about that are in need of our prayers.
All these prayers, Lord, we, uh, we bring to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with each one of you today and always. Amen. Please join us for coffee right after the service.